Well, good morning once again, everybody. So glad that you're here with us and uh, very excited to get into our four-week series, You Can Do Missions. Two years ago, uh, we just felt as your church leadership that we needed to reconnect with the heartbeat of God, the heartbeat of our church, and the heartbeat of our fellowships. And that heartbeat really is about missions. It's, it's, I think, one of the most important things that the church does is to reach people all across the globe. It truly is one of the heartbeats of us as a church. And so I'm very excited to step into another four-week series. We take these four weeks between Mother's Day and Father's Day, and we focus in on global missions and reaching people across the globe. And I'm very thankful uh, for our global missions pastor, Pastor Jake Smith. Jake's been uh, stepping into this role over this last year and a half, and not only has he stepped into it, he has truly propelled uh, our missions awareness, our missions team, and has really uh, reconnected us with the heartbeat of God. And so I'm excited uh, for Pastor Jake to share the word this morning. He is an amazing, amazing speaker. I think you all agree with me. We connect and we learn things in some amazing way when Pastor Jake uh, preaches, and you're going to hear his heartbeat for missions. This isn't just something that Jake talks about. This is something that Pastor Jake does. He's gone across over the seas. He's been building new relationships with missionaries. He's been reestablishing some contacts for us. And so these next four weeks, this is really Pastor Jake's um, hard work kind of coming to fruition, and I think you're going to be encouraged. You're going to be challenged. There's lots of information in, the, in your program. You're going to be hearing more about those things, and so I just want to encourage you over these next four weeks, will you just fully commit to, to being here and engaging with what uh, God is putting in front of us? It's going to be different, different kinds of things happening each and every week, but I think as we go through this, you're going to feel that heartbeat of God for missions, for those all across the world, people who are living in darkness. This is who we are. This is what we do. Would you join me? Would you honor in a big way? Pastor Jake Smith, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I was telling the team, we were going through the, so before service, we worship team practices and the tech team gets organized and um, then we gather to pray, those, who are invo- those of us who are involved in the service, and I said it's just been tough. It's been very busy, and so my, my planning has been kind of scattered feeling. And what I realized was this. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I mentioned that we had led a life group with uh, young adults and college students. And I'll tell you that the real reason, the real reason why you lead a life group is because then you know every other week your house will be clean. I told you we started doing a, a video ser- uh, series, so we'd watch the videos and talk about it. Uh, we started doing that because our TV's in the basement, and our basement needed to be cleaned, and we wouldn't do it, so we moved to the basement, you know, and that's where I work on these messages, and since it's been, you know, four or six weeks since we met, my desk is a mess, and so it's been chaotic, so it's not about you, it's about cleaning our house. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so... I'm glad that landed. I just, it was a new idea, <laughs> new idea for me. Uh, I am excited. I do want to pray because, t- to be uh, honest, I, it has been very busy for me, so I don't feel as organized in my mind, in my heart, as I want to be when I step up here. Uh, and so if you would just pray with me. Lord, thank you for this opportunity to uh, speak to your church. I pray you would speak uh, through me, uh, that these words be your words, and that you would stir our hearts uh, to match yours, uh, which is global. Uh, help us to um, just connect with your heart for the world and our part in that. So we just, we give you this time in your holy name. Amen. So this is our third annual Missions Ephesus Month, um, and it's a time to focus and refocus on missions. Now, it complements our regular missions updates. As, as Pastor Jim mentioned, we have um, uh, regular missions updates. We have missionaries speak, sometimes do a window, sometimes do the whole service. Sometimes I get up here and give you an update about what's going on uh, with the missionary. Uh, there's uh, occasionally uh, specific prayer requests. This complements that. We want to be talking about missions year-round, but this is a time to really refocus on it. At the end of this month, uh, if you look in your, in your program, there's a lot of stuff in there. Uh, I think each of you got an entire tree today just to take uh, home with you, so we thank you for that. There is an opportunity uh, at the end of this month to kind of uh, pledge your mission support uh, to the church. Now, many of you uh, support missionaries on your own. Now, we go to your homes and um, sometimes just let ourselves in. Just kidding. But on your fridges, there are, you know, pledge cards and, you know, for missionaries that you support and uh, pray for, and we love that. We also 
take uh, missions money that you pledge and we support missionaries as a church. So this is an opportunity to pray about, consider uh, what you want to give to uh, those efforts so we can continue to increase the, um, both the amount of money we give and also the amount of missionaries and work that we support globally. So we'll be talking about that more at the end of the month, but just want to let you know that that's something that's there. Um, so that, again, is part of this uh, refocusing. We want to kind of think about what am I to contribute? What is my role in sending? Um, this month, so I want to talk about the theme. The theme is you can do missions. The idea being that we want to spend this next uh, four, so today and the next three weeks after this, talking about our role in missions. We quite often think of missionaries as these kind of mystical, saint-like beings out there, and, uh, and that's not a place for me. I couldn't do that. There's no way I could do that. Well, uh, hopefully, over the course of the next three or four weeks, uh, we can change your mind. Maybe you aren't called to do that, but um, it isn't a matter of uh, ability. It's, um, it's a matter of calling. So we want to talk about that. want to demystify missions and make it accessible. Um, not everyone is called to go, but I think there are more people who are called than actually go. I think there are some of us, it could be a, a variety of callings in our life. It could be an outreach to a neighbor for sure, or it could be an outreach across the seas. But I think there are many of us who are called who don't go. I think that's, that is a greater risk. And sometimes it might be, there's a variety of reasons why it might, that, that might happen. But I want to demystify some things to maybe make it more accessible, more possible for people who feel uh, hindered from, from one reason or another. The schedule is uh, this, th th me, hi. I'm here today, so I'm the first of the four weeks. Next week, we have a special guest. We're going to Skype in a friend of mine who does business as missions. So that one won't be available online uh, because we need to protect where uh, they're at. Uh, they're in a closed country. Um, but uh, business as missions is a really interesting way to do missions. It's, um, we're evolving over the past few decades in how we reach particularly closed countries, setting up businesses um, uh, as a way of creating um, jobs for locals and ways to interact on a normal, kind of natural basis with your community. So he'll be talking about what they're doing in their country. Then the next week after that, Dave Jacob, Dave and Angie Jacob are from this church. Angie grew up in this church. Many of you know them. Dave will be here. The, the Jake was spent, I think, six years in China, and then now Dave is a missions professor at Trinity Bible College. So you will be able to ask a missionary question. So that's this form, this little sheet in your program. If you have a question that you wanted to ask a missionary, you have this week and next week to write it down and, is, and submit it in, uh, to, the, to the ushers. So at the end of this service, the ushers will be in back. You can just put it in the plate if you have a question that comes up or if, over the next week. Something else comes up, comes to mind, submit it in the offering next week. I'll collect those, and Dave and I will, will hopefully, or Dave, will answer those. So you get a chance to ask a missionary. If you have a question about missions, uh, Dave uh, promises to give a beautiful, perfect answer. Uh, I'm trying to put some pressure on it in case he's listening. Um, no, Dave's a great friend. He's been very helpful to us and to me as we're trying to kind of reformat and redevelop our missions program here. Dave has been a great resource. And uh, he's got a great perspective and uh, loves to talk about missions, loves to teach about missions. It's his passion. So we'll have Dave here uh, next week, or in two weeks. And then the last week, June 10th, Brent Silkey, he was here last year talking about his uh, 30 for Freedom run. Uh, he's going to have the whole service. Brent does Chi Alpha at St. Thomas. So Chi Alpha is a home missions work. There is foreign missions through AGWM, so he's a God world missions, and then there's home missions as well. Chi Alpha is a home missions work, and it's at universities creating outreach specifically targeted for college students. The college age is when people uh, stop going to church. Many people who grow up going to church, grow up believing, go to college and stop. Many never return. If they do, it's quite often in the 30s once they start having kids. That cycle is beginning to diminish, and so people are returning to church less. So Chi Alpha and things like InterVarsity, those kinds of things are very important ministries. Uh, putting people on campus, uh, interfacing with college students uh, in their context is very important. So Brent does a great job. He also runs the 30 for Freedom uh, run. Started out as an idea, could I run 30 miles on my 30th birthday and raise some money to end human trafficking? This is now the third or fourth year doing it, and they've raised over a quarter million dollars uh, towards the end. Uh, so that is coming up. Um, next Saturday, a couple of our folks are participating in it, so he's going to talk about that as well. So Brent is going to talk about uh, Chi Alpha and also 30 for Freedom. 
so we're excited to have him there. We do support Dave, and we're going to start supporting Brent Silkey in their, in their ministry at Chi Alpha here um, in a couple months. We're going to be picking them up as part of the schedule. I want to also point your attention to this uh, booklet in your, your guide. This is uh, some information on all of our missionaries. So if you're interested in what our missionaries do, who they are, uh, one thing I need to get better at is getting their faces up in front of you so you can see them when we pray for them. Uh, but this is a way that you can kind of just flip through this, get an idea of who they are and what they're doing. Again, some of them are in closed countries, so be very careful um, about posting anything about them. You can maybe just talk about pray for our missionaries as opposed to naming one just in case um, because some people are in, um, they're at risk any, any moment of being uh, sent home. I was visiting, I was uh, talking with some friends of mine who are missionaries in a close country. And um, some friends of theirs, some other missionaries, had a business they were running, uh, businesses, missions. And they had to go out of the country to renew their visa. And then the country said, nope, you can't come in. So all their household possessions, all their business possessions, all that stuff, just gone. The country said, nope, you can't come back. That kind of stuff does happen. We want to make sure that we don't do anything to to um, make it more difficult. So, but please, pray, pray for these folks. So um, please uh, use that booklet as a guide um, to, to pray for our missionaries. Okay, commercial, that's done. That's what we were looking up for the, the next uh, three or four weeks um, as we go through this missions emphasis. I want to talk about, there's a few words that are kind of missions-y that we haven't talked about a lot uh, in the past few years. We just don't talk about them as much as we used to. And I want to get some of those those words in front of us uh, this morning. Matthew 28, 16, 20 is where we learn about the Great Commission. It says this, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to, to, observe, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You know, there's a lot here, um, but I just want to point out a few things. This is after Jesus has died, he's resurrected, he's come back and he's spoken to the disciples and he's sending them. He says, all authority has been given to me. So again, this is after the resurrection. Jesus now is the story. This is all mine. And guess what? I'm going to send you. I'm going to include you in that story. This is my story. I'm the major plot line, but you're supporting cast members. Your character's in that story as well. I am sending you. I can do whatever I want. And what I choose is to include you, to send you. I send you. I can do what I want, and I choose to partner with you. You are part of my story. But he doesn't just send. He says, I am with you always. He promises to remain present. There's echoes of Matthew 18, 20 here where he says, where two or three are gathered, there I am among them. And Matthew 1, 23, where Jesus is, we find out Jesus' name is Emmanuel, which means what? God is with us. I am with you. I will, I'm sending you, but I'm going with you. I am with you always to the end of the age. So we are sent with Jesus, right? Not sent from Jesus, but sent with Jesus. It's also reminiscent, I think, of God's own self-understanding. I am what I am that I am, right? Just I am. I am the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the end. I am always Jesus says, I am that. I can do what I want. And what do I choose? I choose to bring you into the story. I send you with me. He is present. <clears throat> we are sent, but we are not sent away. We are sent with. And then in Acts 2, 1 through 11, today is the day of Pentecost, the anniversary of the day of Pentecost. We celebrate and we honor what happened then. Here's how how it's written in Acts 2, 1 through 11. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house so that Jesus has has come and he's resurrected. Now they're in, he's, in, he's in heaven with, with the Father and now they're waiting to see what is he going to do. 
And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. And as the Spirit gave them utterance. <clears throat> now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together. And they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, residents, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, I'm sure I'm killing these names, Phrygia, Pamphylia, uh, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and <clears throat> Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So the people have gathered for the uh, Feast of Pentecost. It's also the Feast of Weeks. It's a harvest feast. So God is celebrating, we are celebrating God's covenant with people, with his people. Also, it's a wheat harvest. He's changing the definition. This is a harvest of people. Making this a day of celebrating God's covenant to bring himself, his people to himself. I think, now we read this story and think, really? You know, our skeptical mind. You know, really, tongues of fire come down. I think that it's very likely that it happened in a very similar way to how it's written. Now, it's sometimes very hard to record. Sometimes we read spiritual literature, or we even try to, you know, we try to, I, I challenge people occasionally. Um, explain, pick pictures, na name someone you love, your kids, your spouse, whatever, and define that to me. Describe your love. Why do you love that person? I'll tell you, why, you know, ask me why do I love Michelle. I don't, I don't know. Not because she's difficult to love, but I don't know. There's a mystery to that, right? There's a mystery to that. Why do you love your kids? They're expensive, they're time-consuming, they're noisy, they can be disgusting at times, but you will do anything for those kids, right? Why? Doesn't make a lot of sense. If I had a farm, it might make sense. I'm going to have a bunch of kids so you can take care of stuff. I don't have a farm. Right? I can't even clean my own basement. I told you that. So... Why do we love these people? We don't know. There's a mystery to it, right? So how do we define certain things that happen spiritually? Sometimes the language can be a little bit wonky. It can be a little bit hard to understand. I would suggest that this is pretty close, probably pretty close to how it happened because he's claiming thousands of people heard this. Thousands of people heard this noise at this room and came together to find out what was going on and heard their own languages spoken. So then, sometime later, this story is written down and passed out. And there would have been lots of people who would have said, no, that never happened. I was there. That never happened. So pretty easy to refute that. So it's likely this happened this way, uh, uh, or at least very similar to that, right? So God did this pretty amazing thing, drawing people together. I think there's a few points here, Right? I think the, the point is God is drawing, drew people from around the world. If we can show that next slide, the map slide. This is what it would have represented. They're in Jerusalem where the fire is, right there. That's where all those people were from. So a pretty big section of the world is represented here. Trade routes, major cultural centers. So God brings them all together. They come together to Jerusalem for this feast. And then they go home with what? This new understanding that the gospel is for them, Right? So gospel is for everyone. God's hope, God's heart, excuse me, is global. He makes that clear on the, the day of Pentecost. His heart is global. I think also God was showing off. I think there's some things that happen in a certain way because God's like, yeah, isn't this cool? I can do this and you can't. Right? Just, so, just so you know, in case you've lost perspective, I can do this stuff and you can't. I'm God. So I think God was showing off. I really do. Um, but I think, the main point here is God's heart is global. The gospel is for everyone. And now they're equipped. Yes, the assemblies of God does hold that these gifts are available for believers today. There's, uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find an argument in Scripture that would suggest that they aren't for today. <clears throat> but here we have, if we have access to the Holy Spirit, every believer has, was empowered and called. We are sent not away but with Jesus, and we are sent equipped. Now we are empowered to share the gospel cross-culturally, internationally, 
Prior to this, anointing was a temporary thing. It was an occasional thing, maybe on a king or a prophet or a priest or perhaps a donkey. There's these stories in the Bible where this would be a temporary experience. God would, would anoint someone to give a, a particular word at a particular moment, and then that anointing would leave. Now, there are prophets that seem to experience this more often, but still it was an occasional. It was addressing certain issues in the time or in the culture. Now we have access on a continuous basis to the Holy Spirit. We can be equipped on a regular basis. We can be equipped continuously. We are sent with and we are sent equipped. So when we're asking the question, can I do missions? Yeah. Why? Because you're sent with Jesus and with the Holy Spirit. It's not you. You're not even the major part of the story, right? It's about Jesus. So I mentioned Go Global. It's our, our committee or our, our missions program, and our committee has been working on a few things. We wanted to come up with some words, and I think I've shared some of these with you before, but these are some guiding words for us in our program. And as we make decisions, we wanted to start with first, what do we do? What are we trying to accomplish here? And then how are we going to accomplish? So we had a way of prioritizing things. There's lots of things we could do. We wanted to prior, uh, make a way of prioritizing. So our mission statement is this. RLC, RLC Go Global exists to provide support for missionaries and to promote missions to the church. Our purpose to share the love of Christ with the unreached people of the world. And our tagline is sending and going. So we, we, so we are primarily a sending organization, right? We, we aren't all sent as missionaries. So we, we, we exist primar- in terms of missions uh, primarily as a sending organization. We're, we are committed to, if anyone, even though we prioritize unreached people groups, anyone from our church who wants to be a missionary and goes, we're, gonna com- we're committed to supporting them. And we have sent quite a few missionaries overseas for short and, um, and long, long periods of time. And I think that's a fantastic part of this church. Um, but then we want to focus our support on people who are reaching unreached people groups, so missionary, missions efforts towards unreached people groups. If we can go to the next slide. Um, a people group is an ethno, excuse me, eth- this, uh, this is a big word for the day, ethno-linguistic group with a common self-identity that is shared by its various members. There are two parts to that word, ethno and linguistic, right? They have a culture and a language. What missionaries have learned over the years is group to group, there isn't a lot of gospel sharing. So we don't talk about reaching a country, we talk about reaching people groups within that country. And even if those groups are neighboring, they quite often don't share the gospel cross-culturally within that people, within that, that nation. So there are roughly six to 7,000 people groups that are unreached. This is the 1040 window. This is the language we don't use quite as much anymore, but we used to quite a bit. This represents a lion's share of the unreached people groups. There's some that are outside of these borders, but this is between the 10th and 40th uh, uh, parallel latitude, uh, north, uh, right? Am I saying that right? Um, so this represents most of the people groups. As you can imagine, there, as you, I'm sure, recognizing, this is largely Muslim, Buddhist, and Hindu areas, and plus it's kind of non-religious areas like in China, and then some tribal religions. So we have a religious barrier to cross as well. So this is the 1040 window. Unreached specifically means that, fi- that there are less than 5% professing Christians within a people group. So that means if they're unreached, there's less than 5% of those people in that, in that group that are Christians. And so the likelihood of running into someone who could share the gospel is very, very slim. And 5% would be, the ma- once they cross 5%, they're no longer an unreached group. So it's still a uh, very slim, very small number. Most people uh, live here in North Africa. This is also accounts for 61% of the world's population. 67 countries, 4 billion people, much of the land. Muslims, Hindus, and Buddhists primarily. So we're talking about missions and being empowered to go and our priorities. We want to we, we prioritize uh, missions outreach to, to these groups. There are other important and great missions outreach and works happening in other countries. We don't belittle that at all. Don't knock that. But this is where we've decided we want to prioritize. These are relatively unreached. And there's a video here I, we have that I think will help capture maybe the difference between their and here. There are more believers in a Sunday school class in most of our churches than in all of Yemen.
a thousand needs in the world. None compares to this one. is worthy to receive praise from 6,000 more people groups on the planet. There are needs everywhere, for sure, but it's hard to compare. Yeah? Zero churches in Yemen. There's some more resources on the next slide if you want to write these down, um, if you want to look up more information on work that's... Um, about unreached people group, uh, people groups, or um, the, the last one in particular about human trafficking, uh, re efforts to reduce human trafficking. So we're going to, as a church, we're going to prioritize uh, supporting missionaries who are trying to reach those unreached groups. There are other important things to do for sure, but that's we, what we've chosen as a group. <clears throat> so I know some of you are thinking, well, I couldn't do that. You know, I want to hopefully today say, yeah, you can. It's not about you. Um, it's not about you. You're sent with, and you're sent equipped. Acts 18, uh, there's, a, there's a, a word in there. We used to talk about, we used to talk about tent making. It says this, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Because Claudius, aren't these names awesome? My name's Jake. It's the boringest name in the world. Right? Jake Smith. Like, I fall asleep as I say my own name. I'm like, seriously, I go to Target, and I get you know, these people that are ringing me up with these beautiful names. I'm like, how do you say your name? And they're, you know, I'm the weird guy. But I just, I love names. So Aquila, Priscilla, Claudius. Uh, don't call me Claudius, I won't respond to it. But anyway, Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome and he went to see them. Uh, <clears throat> and he went to see them and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them. So Paul went to stay with um, Aquila and Priscilla. He stayed with them and worked for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. Now, Back uh, when I was in, in Bible college, the missions program had a class called tent making. And it was, this is business as missions, is what it is. This is about, you know, you're going to be self-funding, you're going to go get a job, you're going to work, uh, this is a trade, and then you're going to share the gospel. That's what Paul did. So a lot of his missions efforts were self-funded. There's nothing wrong with funding missionaries, but for Paul, it was important to do it this way. So he was a tent maker. And so these, you know, this tent making class, the students would get there and, and the professor at the time was just passionate and zealous about missions. And inevitably, you know, a few weeks into the, the, the semester, you know, uh, when are we going to learn how to make tents? And it's not a sewing class. We're not learning how to make tents here. We're learning how to set up a business in a country and uh, create a sustainable way to be there, jobs for the locals, etc. It also reminds me of the first message I heard when I got to college. This is the first message. The academic uh, dean talked about Moses, and Moses was called, and uh, God was calling him and trying to empower him to, to lead his people, and Moses didn't want to do it. He was chickening out. You know, I, you know, they don't know me. They don't respect me. I stutter, all this stuff. And finally, I think God, you know, he was bold enough to kind of argue with God, um, but God's, I think, a little bit exasperated. It says, what's in your hand? And I can still hear Dr. Meyer's voice. He had kind of a, I don't know, this, this strong, what is in your hand? It kind of, eh. And I, just, I can hear that still in my head, what, 28 years later almost. What is in your hand? A staff. I'm a tent maker. I'm good at photography. 
you know, I can, I can write well. I'm a carpenter. Right? I'm a musician. I'm good at computers. I'm really good with kids. It's not about you, right? God made you that way. Your hand, your foot, for a purpose. He's a tent maker. Now, Paul was brilliant. He was well-trained. He was a scholar. All those things. But he's a tent maker. And if you're, if you're a person, which you all are, <laughs> you know there are different kinds of smart. I remember this. I was working construction. My, my stepdad was a co- contractor. I was working for a different guy in town. It was the summer after my freshman year of college. And I was moderately skilled at the time. And so I was working, and the valedictorian from our class, who is now a medical doctor, went to Notre Dame, very smart guy, was carrying a sheet of plywood. This guy literally, great guy, it was so bad at his job, our foreman said, okay, see that pile of wood? We need you to move it over there because it's in the way. And he did. And later on the same day, can you move it back? He was so bad. And he was carrying this sheet of plywood, and he was holding it here. And our foreman says, hey, Ryan, Fulcrum. Oh, yeah, it's easier, right? Different kinds of smart, different kinds of skill is what I'm, my point is. So you might not be Paul. You might not be that scholar. It doesn't mean you don't have something to offer. That diminishes God as much as it diminishes you. What is in your hand? Be a tent maker. You know, be a tent maker. Some of you know the Schlacks, uh, Ed and Linda Schlack. They're in Kiev, uh, Kiev, I think is how you're supposed to say it, Kiev, uh, Ukraine. They're missionaries there. They were, Ed was a, a lawyer down in Des Moines, I think, right? And uh, then felt called the missions, came up here. This was their home church while Ed went to seminary. Now they teach and train pastors in Ukraine. My father-in-law, Michelle's dad, has gone and taught you know, for like a couple weeks over there. Incredibly important ministry, training pastors to lead their congregation throughout that part of the world. Ed does that now. What is in your hand? He was able to, had the resources to do that kind of work. Another story that I love, Lillian Trasher. Many of you have heard of her. This, she was born in 1887. And then um, as she was into her early 20s, she got a job at a newspaper. But then an accident, the newspaper gave the job to someone else. So she comes into work and like, oh, I thought... Oh, that was Lillian. Sorry. Uh, so she didn't have a job. So then she moved and she got a job in an orphanage. She met a guy, a pastor. She got engaged, uh, but he didn't want to go into missions. So 10 days before their wedding, she calls it off. And then she heard a missionary who was from Egypt, um, a missionary to Egypt, was back in the States talking, and she thought, oh, well, maybe I want to be a missionary. And then she opened her Bible. There's a passage um, about Egypt. You know? Okay, I guess I'm going to Egypt. So she goes to Egypt. At this point, she's like 23. She goes with her sister. She's got 100 bucks. I didn't translate what that means uh, in today's dollars, but 100 bucks in her pocket. She goes there with her sister. And three months later, she's, uh, some women said, hey, there's a woman who's dying. Will you go take care of her? And she had a malnourished baby. And the woman, the, the woman as she was dying, says, hey, will you take my baby? And they later learned that the, the mom's plan had been to throw her baby in the Nile. I can't, I'm dying. I can't, no one will take her. So Lillian had some orphanage experience, has a baby, I guess I'll start an orphanage. What is in your hand? You know, a baby. Her parents didn't want her to go. Her missions, or she wasn't with the AG yet. Her missionaries didn't, her missionary association didn't want her to go. She defied both. So she, her parents didn't want her to go to Egypt at all. The association didn't want her to do this orphanage. She defied both. She started an orphanage. Lillian is now known as Mama, or the mother of the Nile, She's buried on the grounds of her orphanage. She died in 1961. She survived two world wars there. She was there for 50 years and never went on furlough. She came back, did some fundraising. At some point, I think it was, um, I want to say 1919. AG is what at this point, like five years old? She comes, I love this part of her. (laughs) Uh, Missionaries can be very practical. They're very spiritual and very practical. She comes back to the States and she happens across... uh, uh, an AG pastor or a sermon and service, and she's, she learns a little bit about what we're doing. At that point, the Assemblies of God has always been missions-oriented, has always been missions-oriented. We're a global organization. It's one thing I love about this fellowship. She 
hears about what we're doing in missions. This is five years after we started and says, hey, there's some money there. And so she joins the AG <laughs> so, and then uh, goes back. Within a couple years of being there, she had 50 kids. When she died, there were 1,200 kids living there. As many as 25,000 kids have gone through, have been served by this orphanage. She's known as one of the most inspirational and influential Christians of the modern era. She is the mother of the Nile. There's another similar story. I wish I could remember the details and who this was. A woman was felt called to go set up an orphanage in a country in Africa, but she couldn't get into that country because it was closed. So she said, okay, you know, unthwarted. She set up an orphanage. Let me just make this point. Women, this isn't, women are changing the world in missions. It's true. I mean, you look at the history of India alone, a country that I love, you know that. It's women. It's women that are, it's single women going there and saying, forget you. If you're not going to come, I'm going. I'm going to follow the Lord. So just know that. <clears throat> this woman felt called to a country. She couldn't get in the country, so she set up an orphanage on the border. And then about 10, 15, 20 years later, her sons are now crossing guards. And so she says, Hi, and they say, hey, mama, and she just walks into the country she wanted to get in uh, in the first place, right? What's in your hand? Well, you know, I'll beat you, smart guy government, right? She can do what she wants. She's mama, right? 25,000 people, because a young woman said, I'm not going to let anyone keep me from going. I'm going to go. What's in my hand? Well, I worked in an orphanage. Maybe I'm called to do an orphanage, and I got a baby. I guess I'll do that. I can do that. Um, this summary that God has a variety of ways you can go overseas. I have a few of these up here. There's more at the desk if you want to look through it. Uh, if we go to the next slide. There's a few ways you can do mi uh, missions through the assemblies. There's a lot of great missions organizations. It doesn't have the BAG, but I wanted to uh, make you aware of these things. There, there are short-term opportunities. Uh, it's a one month or less. So like our trip, up to about a month. Uh, about 15,000 people go annually just with the summaries of God. Personally, I don't know that every trip is uh, money well spent. There are some issues with some sh uh, short-term trips. I was telling my mom about this. Uh, in countries like Bangladesh, a lot of people want to go from Europe, from, from the West, to go work in orphanages and, um, and help the babies. The dark side is a lot of those babies are plucked from intact homes to create a cottage industry of an orphanage when they don't need to be plucked from their homes. So we have to be careful about how we're sending our money. Um, that's why it's very important to work with the missionaries on the ground to make sure that the, the missions trip and the missions giving is going to good use. There are short-term opportunities. MAPS is a one to 11 a month uh, missionary associate. The, the, the reason why those are different is there's some tax issues. We can get into that later if you're interested. Um, but then there's also career. Most of the missionaries we support are career. The missionary associate is kind of the gateway drug the AG has started off with. Go, go for two years, go for a year or two, get started, and then uh, we'll get you hooked on it, and then we'll get you going there for, as a career. So that's kind of, it allows people to kind of try it out um, to see uh, if it really is a lifelong calling or not. The Jacobs did that for two years. They went to China for two years, came, came back, and then went there for a full term after that. The, the people we'll be talking with next week are in their third term. They went for two years, went for four, and now they're in their second four-year term. So it's a way to get started into missions, but there's some opportunities uh, for you if you feel called to do that. Again, maybe you have felt called, um, but just haven't gone for one reason or another. So there, the, this information is here as well as at the counter if you want to look through those. I don't think everyone is called to go to missions, to go overseas. I don't think that. I think more are called than go. And what I wanted to do was to have a series of sermons where we can talk about ways we can do that that might awaken something in you. Maybe someone in here has felt like they needed to go and just haven't for one reason or another. For one reason or another, you haven't been able to cross that. You didn't know how. You didn't know who to talk to. You were afraid. Whatever it might be, you know, those are real things, but can we begin to cross over those things? You can do missions. You have something to offer. You are sent with and you are sent equipped. 
Lillian Trasher, the mother of the Nile, showed up there with a hundred bucks and someone put a baby in her hands. That's it. She didn't have a seminary degree. She wasn't rich. She didn't have the support of her family. That was in 1910 when she went. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray now to conclude and then Pastor Jim's going to come up. What I would ask this is if you could over the next few weeks, if you could pray sincerely, Lord, am I called to go overseas? Am I called to serve you in missions? Yes or no? If, not, if yes, then how, where, when? Let's work on that. If no, then how am I to send? What is my role in sending people? Because we're called to go or to send. That is who we are as Christians. That is part of the Christian faith, is to go or to send. So Lord, am I to go? Yes or no? If no, then how am I to send? Some of that may be a financial commitment. Some of that may be um, praying more regularly for your missionaries. Some of that may be joining our missions committee. How am I how am I to send? Am I to go or am I to send? If so, how? Lord, thank you so much for this day, this chance to focus on missions. Thank you for what our missionaries are doing, the sacrifices that they're willing to make, the courage uh, that they have. Lord, be with those missionaries, those who are alone, those who are facing visa struggles, those who are maybe this day hoping to have the interaction with someone sharing your, your gospel. I pray you would encourage them, give them the words and the courage Help them to feel the support from their loved ones and the churches back home. Please be with our missionaries. I pray you be with us here. Some of us, uh, help us to, to ask you honestly, are we called, Lord? And if we're called, give us the courage to step into that. Help us to accept your leading as we move in that calling. If we're called to stay and instead to send, help us to send well. Help us to know what you have for us as senders, Lord. We give you this we ask that you would use us in your global plan of sharing the gospel to the whole world, Lord. We thank you for reaching us. We would not be here if it weren't for the day of Pentecost. We are the result of missionary effort as well. I pray that you would help us remember that and help us to be a part of that in the future. Thank you, Lord. Amen.